Welcome, First Baptist family to First Baptist Church. I'm glad you guys chose to join us this morning. I'd like to read Isaiah 26.3. Many of you are probably familiar with this verse. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. I'd like to begin with this reminder slash encouragement for you is that God is the, the only one who gives us true peace in life. Nothing else in this life is going to provide us with the true, eternal, everlasting peace that we find in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's bow our head and our hearts and ask him to steady our hearts from maybe busy weeks or any kind of pressures that are on us as we begin to our worship service. Our Lord, we love you. We are thankful that you show us love when we do not deserve it, Lord, which is all the time, but Lord, there are certain moments, especially when we feel like we don't deserve it. Lord, we love you and we are thankful for you. And Lord, I pray that we would be able to show that thankfulness right now as we sing to you and as we sing to each other the truths of Scripture, but also as we hear your word preached. So Lord, I pray that our hearts would be steadied on the true peace that we have and that we experience through Jesus Christ. And I pray that throughout this morning worship time, Lord, that our hearts would become more in tune with you and that your spirit would lead us closer to yourself. I pray this by the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you would, join me in standing together. We're going to start off by singing Like a River Glorious.
want to say a quick thank you, you to too. everyone who has given over this last uh, several months and weeks. It's been a blessing to not, like some, struggle in this way with finances. It is a blessing. I don't want to take it for granted, so I want to say thank you for all for giving. For all of you that um, are maybe wondering how you can continue to give, you can give online at give.fbcmish.org, or next to Pastor Pete's office is a slot where you can put any kind of physical checks or anything like that. So we do appreciate your giving during this time, and thank you for that. Uh, if you would, join me in singing His Forever this morning. His Forever. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me, the torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Let's sing together a reminder that we have right now that Christ is our sure and steady anchor.
Let's take a few minutes for personal prayer as we prepare our hearts for worship through hearing the preaching of the word this morning. Our God, thank you for the blessing that we have of having a sure and steady anchor in Jesus Christ, immovable no matter our changing circumstances, situations. Lord, I thank you that Jesus is forever and that he is the same forever. So when we wake up tomorrow morning and situations change and things come, Lord, we have an anchor for our souls and for our hearts and minds to focus on and hold tightly and securely. Lord, I thank you for the privilege that we have of knowing that we will spend eternity with you. I pray that we would look forward to this, to when we have the opportunity to be with you and see you face to face. So in the name of Christ, I pray, amen. If you would and you're able, join me in standing. We'll sing, When We See Your Face.
Take your uh, Bible and turn to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. That is a beautiful song and a beautiful reminder of, of heaven. I don't know about you, but that excites me and thrills me, and I cannot wait for the, the day when we will see him face to face. Um, I just want to give you just a quick update um, some of you have asked about um, what we're going to do with Pastor Nate um, no longer being here, and uh, um, he was able to get off safely on Tuesday, and uh, they are having a service for them today in the, at their new church, an installation service, so pray for them. Um, but what does that mean for us? Um, some of you have asked. Um, we are... Um, uh, just want to give you an update. I've talked to some of you about this, but uh, we... Uh, we'll be moving forward. Pastor Will has been here now for two and a half, little over two years as a pastoral intern, and uh, the deacons are going to be um, going through the process of bringing him before you as a candidate for uh, the, our assistant pastor, and so we move that way. Pastor Will and I are kind of dividing up Pastor Nate's responsibilities, and uh, um, and, and volunteers from the church have taken on some of those as well, and we appreciate that. And so at this time, we are going to move forward with uh, just Pastor Will and myself. And uh, so um, we may be calling on some of you to uh, fill in some of the gaps as well. And so I encourage you uh, to be willing to do that if uh, you are able. Acts chapter 16 is where we'll be this morning. As Americans, we have a thing about standing up for our rights. If our rights are violated, we don't take it sitting down. We may sue. We uh, will write our congressmen. We might protest. Um, But no one takes our rights away as Americans. We don't do well when we're wronged. But the fact is, is that most of us as Americans have never experienced any serious violation of our religious rights. We do not know firsthand the true meaning of persecution. Uh, we, a few of us, um, know the persecution that has been seen in other countries, even in our present day. Now, I am not saying that it is wrong for Christian Americans to stand up for their rights. Uh, We'll see later in Paul's story uh, the idea of him standing up for his rights. But the idea that we always need to fight for our rights uh, as Americans is honestly not seen in the Bible. And I want to talk about that today. The story that we're going to look at today in Acts chapter 16 is a story that is really interesting because in this story, and I'm going to read it for you in a moment, but in this story, Paul and Silas, as Roman citizens, had the right to a trial before any punishment. Romans, by law, were exempt from any public beating, and yet... These two missionaries, Paul and Silas, were falsely accused, they were beaten, and they were thrown into an inner prison with their feet feet locked in the stocks, without any trial at all. Their rights had been extremely violated. If anyone had a right to be angry, they did. But before we get into that, let me just get you up to date on Paul's travels. We have a map here, this is... Um, uh, not the right map. Um, so we have the wrong um, presentation in there. So um, look for the most current one, and uh, we'll get that going. There, there are some adjustments, and we'll figure those out. But uh, 
Uh, that wasn't the map I was looking for. But let me just uh, remind you a little bit of where we've been. Last week, Pastor Will uh, preached an excellent message on handling disagreement. He talked about uh, Paul and Barnabas, and they had this disagreement. And, and so because of this disagreement, they... Um, there we go. That's the right map. Good. Thank you. Um, because of this disagreement, Paul and Barnabas separated. They went different directions. Barnabas headed to Cyprus, where they had previously been, and you can see this map. Paul traveled north. He was in Antioch, and he traveled north, probably went through Tarsus, his, his hometown, and then he traveled through some of those cities that he had previously been through, uh, Derby and Lystra, Iconium, Antioch. Uh, it's interesting, in Acts chapter 16, we're not going to read it, but in the first uh, few verses there, it talks about they went back to Lystra, and it's interesting because it says they picked up a young disciple, and he traveled along with them, a guy by the name of Timothy. Um, and so uh, we're not sure when Timothy was saved. It could be the last time Paul was in Lystra, but here we see Paul takes this young disciple, and he says, hey, why don't you come with us? So they begin traveling around the area. If you see there, um, right above where it says Iconium, it says Galatia. That was the area, the territory. They're traveling along Galatia. And if you look in, uh, in the next few verses, it tells us that they went to city to city. And it said they, it seems as if there was like a closed door. Like they kept going places and God was shutting the door. And so they traveled up to a town way up uh, at the, at the top there of Troas. Troas. And they got to Troas and two significant things about that. First of all, I want you to note in, uh, let's see, Uh, let's look in Acts chapter 16 and go to verse 10. Uh, In in this passage, it tells us we're going to see a significant thing. It says, and when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia. And you say, what's the significance of that? I want you to notice the pronoun we. Why is that significant? If you have looked in the book of Acts prior to this, you have not seen that pronoun we unless it was in a quote. Why does that matter? Well, because who is the writer of Acts? Well, it's written by a guy named Luke. Luke was a doctor. Okay? This is the first time we see it written as we, meaning that this is most likely when Luke joined the journey. Paul had some physical issues. He, he had been mistreated many times, and, uh, and so... Um, it is likely here that Luke begins to travel as Paul's personal physician. And so you'll see that uh, throughout the rest of the book, that those, uh, that those plural um, first-person pronouns will be used often. But here we see, so that's one significant. The, the next significant thing is they, this vision that is mentioned here. They, they, uh, Paul has this vision and the, the likelihood is that because of this vision, he feels God's call on him to go to Macedonia. What's Macedonia? Well, if you look at that map there, all the way over on the left, you can see the, the words going up and down in Macedonia. It was kind of a, uh, the basically northern modern-day Greece. And God tells him to go there, and so he goes. As they sail, they visit uh, a few locations, and finally they end up in a town of Philippi. Philippi is um, where the rest of this chapter um, is located. Um, This is a city that becomes very near and dear to Paul's heart. If you read Philippians, which is Paul's book to this church at Philippi, you can see that he dearly loved these people. Um, And I think the events that we see here in chapter 16 probably is where that it started. This, this bond that was created at this time. And so, the first thing that happens in, uh, when he gets to Philippi is he meets a woman named Lydia. Now, Lydia wasn't from Philippi originally. She had moved there, and, and, and Lydia becomes, she tells us that she's a woman who, who follows God, but she becomes a believer. She becomes a Christian. And, and from that point, Lydia became a great supporter of Paul's ministry, probably financially supporting, maybe at times um, functionally supporting in the sense of it, her home became a place where Paul would stay. And, and we see there that this is the conversion of Lydia. But then we get into uh, what we see as our, our main passage for today. And we see that starting in verse 16. I'm going to read there. It says, And as we were going to the place of prayer... I'm going to pause just for a moment. 
Uh, you remember whenever Paul would go into a city, where would he go first? Synagogue. Okay. Here it says he went into a place of prayer. That tells us a couple things. First of all, it tells us that there was no synagogue. And so what was the place of prayer? The place of prayer was where the Jews would gather. What this tells us is this town of Philippi, not necessarily uh, big or small, this doesn't tell us that, but it does tell us there wasn't a very large Jewish population. Because if there was a large Jewish population, then they would have had a synagogue. And since they only had a place of prayer, it was was a smaller um, location of Jews. Anyway, so they go in the place of prayer, and they, (coughs) they were met by a slave girl, who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Just think, picture that for a moment. Paul's going around, he's teaching, he's preaching, and this girl who is possessed um, and is a moneymaker for these individuals is just following them around, saying that these are, are men of God. What happens next? Paul, having become greatly annoyed, <laughs> I think we all would, uh, he's kind of tired of this, he turns and he says to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out that very hour. For when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews and they're disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in, attacking them. The magistrates tore their garments off and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into the prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. And having received this order, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke of the word of the Lord with him and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then they brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Let's pray. God, we are thankful for this story, for this passage. I pray that you help us to understand it with a clear mind today. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, I could take this passage in many different ways, in many different directions. Oftentimes, people will focus on the salvation of the jailer, and really that is a huge, huge, huge point in this passage. Acts chapter 16, verse 31 is an essential verse for understanding the gospel. We receive a Christ by faith and by faith alone. Not by some religious act or by conformity to uh, rules and laws, but, but we come to Christ. There's, there's no indication here where Paul said, well, you, you got to do this, this, and this, and this to be saved. In fact, it says he was baptized, but it does not say anything about baptism. It was just a, a secondary thing. It was just a, uh, something he did to show that he had come to Christ. And so this, this verse, this passage is very key in for helping us understand what the gospel is. But I want to look at this passage a little different today. Because I think the way I want to look at this today, I think is very pertinent for us today in in COVID 2020. And that is, I would look to, I want to see how Paul responded when he was mistreated. How did he respond? So, two main points here I want you to see today. First of all, Christians should expect to be mistreated. 
We should expect it. I'm not talking about being treated wrongly um, just because we're humans. I'm talking about being treated wrongly because of our faith. And we need to understand the distinction. If you lose your job because you pray on the job, that is being treated wrongly because of your faith. If you hire an electrician to do a job and he does a poor job wiring your house and your house catches on fire and burns down, that's not religious persecution. I think you understand that. But I want to be, on, I want to be clear what we're talking about here. How, how do we respond when we're being treated wrongly because of our faith, because of where we stand, because we are going to be treated poorly? First Peter says this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trials when it comes to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Over and over again, Jesus and Paul and Peter state to us that you are going to be mistreated because of your faith. In fact, it says, if you follow me, you will be mistreated because I I was mistreated. That's what Jesus said. So don't be surprised. Just because God is the omnipotent creator does not mean that he will spare us from intense trials. It's a false teaching that Christians are somehow exempt from common trials that come upon the entire human race, like sickness, poverty, tragedy, and death. In addition to those common trials, I believe there are additional trials that come upon Christians just because we're Christians. I want you to note in this passage numerous ways where Paul and Silas were mistreated. First of all, were the, were, were the false accusations. What was the real reason for their anger? I mean, it doesn't take much to realize what it was. The real reason for their anger was, the, the slave owner's anger, was because they had just been deprived of a major source of income. See, this girl would go around and she would, she would prophesy with, with the help of Satan and she would prophesy and she would uh, foretell about people's futures and, and so people would pay big bucks and so these owners who literally did nothing um, would make a profit off of this girl and now their source of income was gone. Now, nowhere when they dragged, when they took Paul and Silas and dragged them through the city, again, we use this word, we saw this word recently, that word drag there is not, hey, hey, let's pick up and gently carry you over. No, this is literally they're dragging them around the city and they bring them up to the, to the marketplace and they bring them up to the magistrates, to the officials, and, and nowhere in their uh, reasoning of why they're doing that do they say because we lost income. Rather, they accuse them of throwing the city into confusion and of proclaiming confidence customs that were not lawful for Romans to accept. These charges were simply not true. And sometime as Christians, if you stand up for your faith, you are going to be falsely accused. You will. You will stand up as being, uh, you'll be told you're a hateful person. And we need to understand that. But it goes beyond that. Further, there was a, there was a racial prejudice that, uh, behind these false charges. Look at, look at this passage. Look at verse 20. Uh, when they come before the magistrates, what do they say? These men are Jews. Now, this wasn't just a clarification statement. This was actually a, a, a derogatory way, uh, statement that they were making. They were, they were saying here, this was, uh, this was a prejudiced phrase against these men because they were Jews. So you have to understand that the Roman emperor Claudius had, had, had been mistreating Jews and had just made an edict in 49 AD that all Jews were to be removed from Rome. This um, story takes place in AD 50. So this is a year later. And so the anti-Jewish sentiment was extremely high. The Jews were mistreated. Now, the Jews were allowed to do their religion as long as they didn't try to uh, uh, convert Romans. An attempt to convert Romans actually could be a problem and it would be seen as something wrong. And so here they're mistreated merely because of their Jewish um, blood. 
continue on. Paul and Silas's legal rights were violated. They were assumed guilty without a hearing, without a trial. Here, Paul, Paul was a Roman citizen. We know that. Uh, the belief is Silas probably was a Roman citizen as well. And so both of these men, as Roman citizens, by Roman law, they were uh, supposed to be given an opportunity to uh, stand up and have a trial and defend themselves. And yet they weren't given that opportunity. They were physically attacked in an inhumane way. In a way that was not fit for a Roman citizen. They were locked in stocks, which was a painful torture in and of itself, let alone the fact that right after you'd gotten beaten with rods, to be locked in stocks in a very uncomfortable position would have been um, just horrible. See, our religious rights are going to continue to be violated as we go on in our country. I'm not trying to paint a horrible picture. I'm trying to get us to understand. Because we live in a world where, where in so, so-called neutrality, so-called acceptance means that our religious beliefs are going to be attacked. And we have to know that. And we have to say, uh, how do we respond? We have to understand that our religious rights are going to be attacked. I I heard a few years ago that a a Supreme Court ruled that, and and I hope you're not offended by this, but this is where we live. This is our world. The Supreme Court ruled that nude dancing was entitled to considerable legal protection because it was expressive behavior. That was a ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court. Around the same time, there was another ruling because there was, a, there was a court case that went up and ended up in the Supreme Court about a particular high school where, where there was these, this student that was running for student body president and his entire platform was that he was going to bring prayer back to the high school football games. And he lost his case and it was shot down. Our religious freedoms are going to be attacked. We hear all the time about businesses that are, that are being sued because they won't be involved in weddings or other events that go against their religious beliefs. We hear about believers around the world who are facing persecution for their faith. In whatever form it takes, you should not be surprised when you're treated wrongly, poorly, God does not give Christians an exemption even when they are in the middle of doing his will and pursuing his kingdom and obeying what he wants them to do. Paul and Silas, you know, here they are, they're in jail, and they're not sitting in jail going, oh, maybe we missed God's signals. I mean, maybe, maybe he didn't really mean us to come to Macedonia. No, he made it pretty clear. I want you to go to Macedonia. And so they knew something. They knew they were right where God wanted them to be. And in the middle of God's will, there was still no guarantee of protection from trials. You know, somehow we think, if, hey, if we're doing God's will, everything's going to work out hunky-dory. So like Paul and Silas... We as Christians will, will have times where we will be mistreated for our faith. Now, ours may be never in our lifetime, but will we experience what Paul and Silas did? But we will experience mistreatment. So then the question is, how do we respond? And that brings us to our second point. Christians should trust in a faithful God when mistreated. See, trust reveals itself in a right response. How do we respond? Paul and Silas show us four aspects of right response to wrong treatment. So let's look at those four here. First of all, continually keep your joy in the Lord. Paul and Silas, having their rights been violated, their backs uh, torn apart, their bodies bruised, their feet uh, locked in, uh, in, in stocks in, in a dark prison that probably was disgusting. What were they doing? Look at verse 25. They were praying and singing hymns to God at midnight. As I was studying this week, this was, it, it, it rebuked me. 
you know, what, what things happen to us this week, I think about me personally, I'll take it to me. What things happened to me this week that instead of um, responding with joy, I responded with a nasty attitude? What about you? God desires for us to rejoice. Do you know that the most, uh, the most frequent command in the Bible is, is to, to be happy or to rejoice or some, something along that lines? God promises us that if we follow him, we're going to have hard times. Yet, at the same time, God commands us to be happy, to rejoice, to have joy. Paul and Silas would not have been rejoicing the Lord in jail at midnight under these awful circumstances if it wasn't already a part of their regular life. But it was. See, they had this daily habit of mentally focusing on how great and wonderful God was and, and, and his many blessings and, and, and all the great things he'd done for them. And the greatest blessing was their salvation by faith. And so that because they had this habit of rejoicing in God and having joy in God, it, it wasn't hard for them to rejoice in God when they were in the midst of a horrible trial and horrible persecution. Remember what Paul said to this very church in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4? What did he say? He said, rejoice in the Lord. How often? Always. Always. You know, it would be easier if God would say, you know, rejoice in the Lord most of the time. But always? I mean, come on, Paul. Get real. Always. And then later on, he says this, in everything, give thanks. Always, in everything. The question we I ask is, Paul, did you even live in the real world? I mean, did you even, did you even understand what life was really like? I mean, did, did you ever experience anything hard? <laughs> yes, he did. And yet, he uses those phrases over and over and over again. Rejoice, always, give thanks in everything. And we need to keep something in mind here because it's very easy for us to look at this story and see the, the end of the story. Uh, but we need to keep in mind that Paul and Silas did not know the end of the story when they were singing and rejoicing and praising God at midnight in a jail. They didn't know. For all they knew, they would be executed the next day or left to, to rot in this prison the rest of their life. They had no idea of knowing. Their, their singing was not based on knowledge of a happy income. Their singing was based on knowledge of a good and sovereign Lord. Now, in this instance, uh, his will was to free them, and so God sent this powerful earthquake that freed them of these bonds and opened the doors, and it doesn't always work out that way. Many saints, many Christians, in fact, Paul will at one point be executed and die for their faith. But a cheerful, joyous spirit does not depend on having wonderful, trouble-free circumstances. Uh, G. Campbell Morgan, a preacher, uh, said this about Paul. He said, he did not sing because he was let out of prison. He sang because prison didn't really matter. And I want to emphasize this first point because it's the foundation for the next three. The first point here is we need to have joy. There are so many Christians that are grumbling, discontented people that complain about everything that happens against them, whether it's uh, just because of life or because of being a Christian, and, and there's too many Christians like that. And we need to be cultivating joy in our life, cultivating a rejoicing spirit in everything we do. But secondly... I want you to think about this as a response to uh, being mistreated is we need to lovingly guard your witness to others. Now, Paul and Silas were not singing so that they could be a good witness in difficult situations. They were singing because their heart was full of praise towards God, uh, but the overflow of worship was that they were incredible witnesses. And that's how it should be. That's, that's what it should be. Uh, that when, when we rejoice, when we go through trials with our head held high and our eyes on Jesus, that the world around us will look and they'll say, hey, they handle this differently. 
Notice what, uh, what Dr. Luke tells us in this passage. Look at verse 25 again. It says, At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And what does it say next? And the prisoners were listening to them. And here, here's the thing I want to tell you. They always are. The world is always listening and watching God's people, especially in a time of trial to see how we respond. If, if Paul and Silas had sat there and had a, had a pity party, and you know what? Maybe inside they wanted to. If they had sat there and had a pity party because their rights were violated, if they uh, yelled and screamed and complained, they would have missed the great opportunity for witness. Years ago in the former Soviet Union, a, a criminal who later came to Christ and became uh, a church leader, he, he wrote about his experience in prison. He said this, among the, great, the, among the general despair, while prisoners like myself were cursing the camp, the authorities, and those around us, the Christians did not despair. One could see Christ reflected in their faces. Their pure, upright life, deep faith, and devotion to God became a shining example of life for thousands around them. And like Paul, we should aim at doing all the things we do for the sake of the gospel because the prisoners will be listening. If you get, go to work and you're mistreated for your faith, you know what your coworkers are watching. If you're in your family and you're mocked for your faith, you know what? Their other family members are watching. If you go out into the world and we're, we're mistreated because of a certain viewpoint you take, you know other people are watching. And so lovingly guard your witness. Thirdly, expectantly trust your sovereign God to work for his glory. I have a hunch that if many of us were to go through what Paul and Silas suffered and we were praying at midnight, what would be the content of our prayer? God, get me out of here now. I can't prove it. But I also have a hunch that that was not what Paul and Silas were praying. You say, how do you know that? If that was what Paul and Silas were praying, then when the earthquake shook and, and the chains fell off and the doors went flying open, you know what happened? Paul and Silas would have been like, we're out of here. But they didn't. I think if they were offering any petition, it would have been, Lord, use this situation for the furtherance of your glory and the gospel. See, Paul and Silas knew that God was sovereign. That meant God's plan was perfect. And they, they knew that God could have been, prevented them from being beaten. He could have prevented them from being thrown into prison in the first place. But he didn't. And so they trusted that God must have something greater in mind. And he did. You know, I believe that when Paul later writes to this church and this church that had now blossomed into a church that loved God, I believe that if you look at this passage, who, <laughs> what's the amazing thing? Who, who were the, the foundations of this church? Oh, Lydia, a girl who had been possessed, and a jailer. And if Paul and Silas had said, we're out of here, we're running as fast as we can, they would not have that impact, but they, they waited, they trust in the sovereign God to do the right thing. The real issue when you're treated is, do you trust in a sovereign, powerful God who could have prevented this situation if he willed? If you do, then the next issue is to pray, Lord, use this difficulty to further your glory and your gospel. You know what's interesting when, I, when, when you read through Paul's writings? Many of his writings, many of Paul's books, he wrote from prison. And many of them, he starts off, but you know what you don't see in his books? You don't ever see this. Paul starts off a book and he says this, 
Paul, a prisoner of the wicked Caesar who unjustly put me in this prison. No, what does he say? Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. You know, you know what Paul is, there's a number of things Paul is saying by that, but you know what Paul is saying? I trust in my sovereign God. And my sovereign God allowed me to be in this situation. And so I trust he's going to use this situation for his glory. You know what Paul knew? If he trusts in his sovereign God, and we should the same, is that, you know what? God could overthrow Caesar in a second. But he might not. But maybe as we come to the conclusion, you're asking this. Does trusting God mean that we should never stand up for our rights? Do we just lay there as Christian doormats and take whatever happens passively? And that leads to my final point. I want to conclude with this. We need to humbly know when and why to stand for our rights. Look, if you will, at this passage, and and I'm going to read for you the last portion here in uh, chapter 16, verse 35. When it was day, so all these events happen, when it was day, the magistrates, these are the guys that sentenced them to be beaten, to be thrown into prison. The magistrates sent the police, saying, let these men go. And the jailer reported these words to Saul, saying, the magistrates have sent uh, to let you go, therefore come out now and go in peace. Cool! Yeah, we can go! Let's get out of here. But notice what Paul does, verse 37. But Paul said to him, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens, have thrown us into prison, and do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. Wow. So here's the thing. Paul and Silas went through all that, took it, for the glory of God. And now they try to decide, hey, we're going to stand up for our rights. Why? I, I think there are, there are two reasons for that. Number one, Paul was concerned for justice. And Paul was concerned that justice was realized. And he, he knew that that was important. And he knew that it was important that, that the law be followed. And by law, what happened to them was wrong. But secondly, Paul was also concerned for the future of this church that he was going to leave behind. And by making these officials realize that they had committed a serious offense against Roman citizens, what Paul was doing was ensuring that that, uh, trouble would would not come on these believers in uh, Philippi. And he also was assuring that he, he could probably come back and not face problems himself. Now, by rights... Paul could have gotten these officials in huge, huge troubles by taking this case to the higher authority. Read on, verse 38. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid because they knew. They were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens, so they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Now, Paul could have, um, by right, had the head of these officials. But he let their wrong go unpunished. And I think he showed from that that Christians aren't, aren't to be out for personal vengeance. He taught to forgive those who sin against us, who mistreat us, while at the same time holding them accountable uh, to change their behavior. I want to say in conclusion that this one instance does, does not exhaust the biblical teaching on when to stand for your rights and, and when to let them go. Uh, in fact, we'll get into more of that as we get into more of Paul uh, understanding that. But, but some wrongly teach that we should never defend ourselves e- either legally or against aggressive attacks against our character or even our person. And all I can say here is when you're treated wrongly, 
When we're treated wrongly, and again, I'm making a distinction here between treated wrongly just because, you know, we're human or treated wrongly because we're, we're, we're Christian. When you're treated wrongly because of your faith, your response should be motivated by the furtherance of God's glory and the gospel first and by the administration of God's justice through the laws and the government second. Because in everything we do, it should be the glory of God. Again, it does not mean we st- we're, we're doormats. But it does mean this, that sometimes God has a better plan. Now, my main application for this story takes me back to the very first point that I um, made um, under the, our response, and that is um, having joy in the Lord. Whether you're being persecuted or just having everyday trials, God desires for you to have joy, and everything else flows from that. If, if I radiate joy because I've entrusted my soul to God, then even when I'm treated poorly, even when I go through trials, he will be glorified. God will be glorified, not me, and others will be drawn to the Savior. The late Romanian pastor, uh, Richard Wormbrand, spent 14 years in prison for preaching the gospel. Three of those were in solitary confinement. His cap- captors smashed four of his ver- vertebrae, and it was said that uh, either by cut or by burn, he had 18 holes in his body that were given to him by the, the soldiers. Yet he was never defeated. He testified this. He said, alone in my cell, cold, hungry, and in rags, I danced for joy every night. Can you imagine that? During this time, he asked a fellow prisoner who he had led to Christ before both of them were arrested. He said, do you have any resentment against me that I brought you to Christ? The man responded, I have no words to express my thankfulness and my joy that you brought me to my wonderful Savior. I would never have it any other way. May God enable us when we are mistreated, when we are um, persecuted, to imitate these men of God in trusting our souls to our faithful creator and doing what is right. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for uh, your word. Your word does not promise us an easy path. Lord, and by your sovereignty, as American Christians, you have given us a relatively easy path. And yet, Lord, we know, we can see that unless you divinely intervene, that easy path is slowly disappearing. And for many Christians, that's a scary thought. And oftentimes our first response is to to stand up and defend our rights. Lord, there may be times you want us to do that. Lord, there may be times that you have a bigger plan in mind. Lord, we ask for wisdom. We ask for wisdom to know how you want us to respond. Really, Lord, what we ask is that you work in us and allow us to experience joy. It's easy to be Gloomy, discouraged, depressed, down. But that's not what you want us to be. So Lord, I pray you help us as as believers to rejoice. No matter the circumstance, that we will rejoice. And then we will, through that joy, we will pursue a, a right witness before others so that you can get the glory. Lord, and I pray that you help us to address those ways in our life where we're disobeying you. 
so that we can be the testimony that we need to be. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. With not knowing what the future might hold for, for people, it's really easy to focus on the fear of that, like the fear of um, what the future might hold for followers of Christ or even other people. So what, what's helpful to do in those times or even these times right now is to focus on truth, what you know to be true and the privilege that we have of trusting in Jesus Christ. So why don't you stand with me and, and worship with me right now. I'm reminding ourselves of truth, of, of the blessing of trusting in Jesus Christ. Sing with me, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. do uh, close us out in a word of prayer then we'll have our announcement video we'll, we'll have a seat then we'll have our announcement video and then you'll all will be dismissed after that pray with me our God Lord I praise you and I thank you that we can have joy in the face of trials and in the face of persecution Lord which um, you, you, you promise us that some forms of persecution will come against followers of Christ and they take different forms and they look differently in uh, different cultures and different countries and different situations. So Lord, I thank you that we can have joy in Jesus Christ, even through the harshest of circumstances. I thank you for the example of, of Paul that we're able to learn from. Um, I pray that Lord, that we would uh, act on that and that we would um, not hold too tightly to things that can be stripped away from us, but to hold with everything we have tightly onto what cannot be taken from us, which is Jesus Christ. I pray that our joy would come from, from your son, Jesus, and from, rather than from anything else this world has to offer. So I thank you for Jesus. I pray that we would hold tightly to him above all. It's the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. guys pour so many hours into expanding this stage and making it look awesome. 
So if you're able to, say a special thank you to Dennis and Doug for being willing to serve us in this way. As Pastor Pete said in the letter he sent out a few weeks ago, he will be visiting every single family in the church. Now he's had an awesome time so far, but it will take a long time to get to everyone. So if you think you might have been overlooked, trust me, you have not. Please, be patient and Pastor Pete will eventually schedule a time to get together with you. Finally, if you are new here at First Baptist Church, thank you so much for joining us in worship. If you stop by our guest center in the annex, you can pick up one of the gifts that we have set up for you. Have a great week, First Baptist.